Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new session of the Understanding 3 uh, conference. Uh, it's been a long day, and uh, I'm incredibly grateful to our speaker today, Maria del Gosagio Martinez Ogdaz, for being here with us. She's uh, affiliated with the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, but I believe she's currently in Mexico City. Uh, and the difference in time zones makes her attendance and continued and active contributions just heroically outstanding. So thank you so much, Magia, for all that. And um, her talk tonight is titled Ignorance and in Insights in Scientific Understanding, the Anomalous Neutrinos. Magia, please take it away. Th thank you very much, Andre, and thank you, everybody, um, for staying this long. Um, I have learned a lot from all of you, and I apologize for the to the speakers that I missed your talks. Wake up early is, is a bit difficult for me. And so today, um, I'm going to be talking about ignorance, insight, and scientific understanding. And basically, what I, I will try to do is to map how can we move from ignorance to understanding and whether insights play any role for this matter. And so the aim for this talk is to sketch an epistemological landscape of the detection and overcoming of highest degrees of ignorance in order to gain knowledge and understanding when dealing with Rosidian anomalies, especially how can we get understanding more than knowledge. I'm going to mention something about that, but uh, I'm, I'm going to focus on the case of understanding. So the main thesis here is going to be summarized in at least three main points. First, ignorance associated um, or present in cases of resilient anomalies is something that I tend to call ignorance of theoretical structure. I'm going to say more about this concept in, in a minute. Second, the partial overcoming of this type of ignorance is associated with the reliable views of specific insights that later on will lead to further epistemic achievements such as understanding in particular model understanding. And so that's the third component of the main thesis here. Uh, such a model understanding plays a privileged role in the future overcoming of ignorance in similar contexts. And before moving forward, I, I want to make a, I don't know if this is a disclaimer or just a note. I am not only a philosopher of science, but I am also um, a philosopher of logic. And so my account here is going to be in general uh, of the inferentialist type, but I think um, it doesn't necessarily commit you to any type of logic or any type of a particular formal strategies or formal resources in general. So that said, let's talk about understanding before moving forward. So take the general uh, and the common characterization of what understanding is and say that it consists of knowledge about the relations of dependence. And as I was saying, because I want to emphasize the inferentialist role here, uh, one can say that when one understands something, one can make all kind of correct inferences about it and consider that to be the general idea of what understanding is. Now, model understanding in the literature is something such as that one has model understanding of some phenomena, if and only if one knows how to navigate some possibility space associated to the phenomena. This possibility space is often constrained by a particular theory or a particular model regarding that phenomenon. I'm so sorry, this is the Mexican culture, so it's a, a truck selling something. Um, but so one of the main intuitions that especially epistemologists of science working on understanding might have is that this type of understanding, model understanding, is a, a, in a sense a direct consequence of this general idea of what understanding is. So it, it is located in a logical space that we can navigate and draw correct inferences about it. So the intuition might be that model understanding is in a sense too weak to give us something back, that it only allows us to explain very weak cases of understanding, very vague cases of understanding, but doesn't help us to move forward in the achievement of other understanding regarding other things. So here I'm going to claim that that's not the case. And maybe that's the most interesting takeout from, from the talk. I'm going to say that we can move from ignorance to model understanding using insights, but also that that model understanding will help us to go back to similar cases of ignorance and help us to solve them or at least to deal with them in a satisfactory way. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to do this from an inferentialist point of view. That said, the plan is the following. So 
first of all, I'm going to present some preliminary concepts, which are also like the basic concepts of all the talk. Then I'm going to start drawing this map that I set, and I explain how we tend to move from ignorance to something else, which is not understanding yet. And it's not clear that it's knowledge still. Uh, and then how we can overcome that ignorance in order to gain understanding. And finally, I'm going to emphasize how can we strengthen our understanding via insights, and I'm going to draw some conclusions. That said, um, as you all are epistemologists, um, I'm not going to focus much on ignorance, but you know that uh, the traditional view on ignorance tends to characterize ignorance as lack of knowledge. And so because we have different types of knowledge, then we are going to have different types of ignorance. We are going to have factual ignorance, objectual ignorance, procedural ignorance, and this new type of ignorance that is called um, answer, ignorance of answers to questions. So something that we can say about this one is that it doesn't necessarily uh, reduce to factual ignorance in many cases, because it seems to, to point out to the fact that we cannot even phrase something or that we cannot recognize something as being the case or not being the case. So that's uh, the main component that makes it different. But I, I also have been claiming for some years already that uh, some of these cases of ignorance had an underlying type of ignorance, which is the one of theoretical structure. And let me say more about that. Ignorance of theoretical structure is lacking knowledge of the relevant inference patterns that scientific theories or particular theories allow for. When ignoring the relevant parts of the theoretical structure of a theory, scientists are not capable of grasping abstract causal connections between the proposition of their theory, and they can neither identify the logical consequences of the propositions that they are working with, nor can they explain under which conditions the truth value of such propositions can be false. And the thing about ignorance of theoretical structure is that the first intuition that we might have is, oh, this is a type of procedural ignorance. Because inferences tend to seem like procedures, right? So I move from one premise to another or from a set of premises to a conclusion, and I can reconstruct that as a procedure, maybe a more rational procedure, but still a procedure. But for this particular case, there is a difference between saying I can move from a set of data to a particular conclusion. And there is the, the other phenomenon of being able to identify the logical constraints of something that explain how I can move from one set of premises to a particular conclusion and not to another. So this ignorance of theoretical structure involves both, involves the practice. And in that sense, the salient feature is going to be a procedural type of ignorance but also involves the lack of knowledge about logical constraints, which are not going to be facts. So it's not going to be reducible to uh, factual ignorance, uh, are not going to be objects uh, for different reasons in, in discussions in philosophy of logic. And as I said, are not going to be reducible to uh, just procedures. Now, insights. Um, for the matter of this talk, let an insight be a belief that first is informed through an unclear or opaque or unrigorous processes, or that we have not access, epistemic access to what the type of process was and how reliable it is. But despite this, uh, it seems to be strong, informative and robust enough to guide our adoption or rejection of other beliefs. Insights allows us to evaluate some epistemic virtues of a specific sets of belief, considering the ways in which other beliefs relate to them. That's the general idea of what an insight will be in the following parts of the talk. Now, understanding, as I said, let's adopt the general idea and say that it is about relations of dependence. And these relations of dependence might be of different kinds. Some of them are going to be logical, some of them are going to be causal, some of them are going to be uh, metaphysical or things like that. It, it really would depend on the perspective that you have on further ideas regarding understanding. But so scientific understanding, adopting this idea, would consist of building networks that successfully connect our scientific beliefs about the world. And this is something that I really want to emphasize, that scientific understanding is, in a very broad sense, a relational phenomenon. It consists in putting together things in order to get a better, a more complete, a more accurate picture of the world or, or the particular domain that we are studying. 
So when we understand, it's not only that we can combine or put in the same basket bits of knowledge that we have, but we can make sense of how these bits of knowledge relate to one another in order to save the phenomena in the best or the more explanatory way or the more um, easy way for us to, to see uh, or to make sense of it. So now let's move to, to the main thing, unless you have any clarificatory questions at this point. No? Okay, so we can move to ignorance and how can we avoid the ignorance. The main question that we might have is which cases of ignorance are going to be interesting for us? Because as it's obvious, we know less than the things that we ignore. So um, we have ignorance everywhere. We have cases of ignorance, not only in our daily life, but in science and those cases don't bother us. So where can we start in such a way that it's problematic enough for gather our attention and make sense uh, for us to avoid that ignorance and gain understanding. What I suggest to do is to start with the anomalies. And the reason why I think this is the most important uh, start point or the at least more intuitive one is that anomalies often posit a challenge for us, help us to uh, discover that we have a problem in science that often relates to, um, to the lack of information or to the lack of clarity about how things are happening in that particular domain. And so anomalies are red flags, but also are good heuristical um, elements for uh, the moving forward of scientific development. So what are anomalies are in general? Anomalies consist of the presence of a statement, let's call it S, such that when combined with a particular theory and a satiris paribus clause, the statement becomes a potential falsifying statement for the theory. So, that's the general um, characterization of anomalies. It comes from Lakatos, but it hasn't changed much. And if we look at the literature, what we are going to find is that there are two main types of anomalies. Things that show gaps of information that are often called lacun um, by Theo Kuypers, and the things that seem to be logical contradictions that are the result of having too much information. So, um, the lacunes, as I said, are explanatory or predictive or descriptive gaps and uh, logical contradictions often consist in propositions that one can be the result of the theory or um, an outcome from the theory and the other one an observation or uh, another bit of information that we know has to be combined with the theory. And they conflict in such a way that we reconstruct it as a contradiction. That said, it's very intuitive to say that lacunes come from ignorance. As they are interpreted as lacking information, then that's going to be, we ignore certain type of information or certain uh, bits of data that we need to solve the problem. But so that also tell us where to look for or what to look for at least. What happens with contradictions? So with contradictions, the, the main intuition is that they actually reflect an error. But if we press the discussion in the literature on inconsistent science, what we are going to see is that uh, philosophers of science often reconstruct these cases as lacking information as well. But which type of information? Information about truth values. So what they are saying is that when you have a contradiction, what actually is happening is that you don't have enough information to decide which of the elements is going to be false. At least one of those uh, intuitively is going to be false. So which one? Um, and so that says that we at least lack the information needed to dismiss one of those. And that is the reason why we keep something that looks like a contradiction. So it's also ignorance. Now, the question is uh, what causes this factual ignorance regarding contradictions? And more importantly, what causes the resilient character of the anomalies? Because as you remember from the beginning, I said, I want to focus on the ca on cases of anomalies that are actually resilient, those that last one decade, one century, uh, that has have a lot of debates around them in order to interpret them, in order to solve them, and that seem to posit a challenge for scientific rationality. So the question is, what is causing that these anomalies last for so long? And my idea is, is ignorance of theoretical structure. And that is very easy to see, especially in the cases of factual ignorance uh, for contradictions. 
So what often happens is that scientists are not in a good position to determine which are the inferential patterns that are going to be deciding the truth values of, of the elements when in, in a particular theory, within a particular theory. So they are still exploring the theory and they find two things that seem to be compatible, independently compatible with the theory. One is a consequence maybe, and the other one is an independent observation. Both seem to be reliable, inferentially or uh, instrumentally or whatever uh, the type of justification that we have. And, and nonetheless, we cannot say which matches the theory and which doesn't which shouldn't be incorporated into the inferential body of the theory that we are working with or the model that we are working with. If we look at the large majority of cases that uh, illustrate the presence of contradictions in the sciences, we are going to see that that's the main discussion between scientists and that's the main intuition uh, behind the philosophical reconstructions of what's happening there. So um, what, what often happens also is that we have at least three options when we have these resilient anomalies. So the first one is, um, the, the zero one is avoid using this theory or this model that is problematic because I have a better one over there. And so that wouldn't make the anomaly resilient, right? So that option is out of the discussion. So we have three once we say that there is no alternative theory or there is no better model that we can substitute this one with. These options are just reject this uh, set of information that is problematic, just accept it, or just tolerate it. So first one, um, rejection. Because we have no alternative, and especially in the case of contradictions, we have no explanation of which of the elements is going to be false, then rejection doesn't seem like a rational option. It's going to happen the same with acceptance. So uh, to accept that there is a gap or to accept that there is a contradiction, meaning that um, this gap is essential to the phenomenon in question or the contradiction is essential to the phenomenon in question, doesn't also seem uh, a good or a rational option because we don't have enough information for justifying acceptance. We can justify in a sense something that looks like weak acceptance, but that weak acceptance is actually the toleration of the, of the problem that we have, either uh, a gap or a contradiction. So, um, but to say that rejection and acceptance are not rational options is not enough to say that we are able to tolerate this, only that we are motivated or, in, or rationally inclined to be tolerant towards um, this analysis. Now, because, because the type of ignorance that is underlying this problem is ignorance of theoretical structure, the solution or the way to tolerate this is going to relate to theoretical structure as well. Now, just make a pause and I'm going to start talking about a particular case to exemplify what I have been saying so far. Many of you might have been in contact with the anomaly of solar neutrinos, especially um, is the so-called the solar neutrinos problem. In the 30s, um, there was an anomaly that beta decay as a phenomenon was not explainable. So, something was happening, we didn't have enough uh, theoretical tools to explain what was happening there. And suddenly Pauline said, uh, there is a subatomic particle over there that we can call neutrino that is doing a particular job here in order to um, get phenomena such as beta decay. So when Pauline's explanation came to the discussion, neutrinos were characterized such as subatomic particles, a fermion in particular, that were electrically neutral. Uh, neutrino means the little one. So that said that either they had a tiny mass that was uh, not relevant for any calculation or they were massless. Neutrinos also were expected to interact only via the weak interaction and gravity, which made them very easy to escape. And because they almost never interact with normal matter, they can freely escape their sources, so, uh, which are often the stars, but also uh, the, the experiments that we have developed so far. And that gives people the impression that this was a pity because neutrinos seem to be a good theoretical um, entity that was helping to explain particular phenomena in radiochemistry, but uh, were not enough for being measured 
because we didn't have the technologies in order to produce neutrinos and not even to measure them. So, uh, but there was a good epistemic backup for trusting that neutrinos existed, which was that without neutrinos, beta decay wouldn't be able to be explained. But with neutrinos, we didn't know, we didn't need anything else to explain the phenomenon. So that actually uh, reinforced the idea that neutrinos existed and that in a period of time, we were going to be able to test their existence in a favorable result. Now, the challenges for an experiment, as I was saying, come from neutrinos. They do not emit nor absorb light. They don't have an electric charge. They are extremely lightweight. And the only way to study them is by their interaction with the weak nuclear force. But as all of you know, that is very challenging. And so when a neutron interacts with an atom, it produces other particles. And that can be detected and measured by us. That was a good insight that uh, physicists had at the moment, but they didn't really know how to proceed in order to develop these experiments. Now, there are two types of sources of neutrinos. The ones that are natural are sun, cosmic radiations, other stars, uh, etc. The man-made ones are nowadays particle accelerators, nuclear power plants, and nuclear bombs. So um, there are a huge number of neutrinos or anti-neutrinos, depending on the experiment, uh, in this type of huge detectors. So Actually, the first experiment that was taught was the project Poltergeist. And just as an, an, in, an anecdote, uh, it really shows how important it was for the physicists to test. So the initial version of the project Poltergeist was to create a nuclear bomb, a quite a small nuclear bomb, dig a hole, put the nuclear bomb inside, hope for the best, and try to check later whether there were certain neutrinos being uh, generated by the bomb. This obviously wasn't the most practical <laughs> strategy. So it took them some years. They got uh, a first version of uh, the Poltergeist project in the 50s, but it still wasn't very conclusive about the presence of neutrinos. And so we moved to the 60s. In the 60s, John Bacall decided, John Bacall was a physicist, but uh, a theoretical one. So he decided that he wanted to test the presence of neutrinos, that neutrinos were that important that they had to be tested. And he developed something that is now called the standard solar model, which is mostly a mathematical model that allows us to see uh, how the stars behave. So we put some information about particular stars, and then we got a lot of data about those stars, going from things such as the presence and the flux of solar neutrinos to uh, the presence of heavy metals in that stars, etc. Now, he develops this uh, formal tool, and now he has to find somebody that develops an experiment. And he goes to Ray Davis. And so Ray Davis in the 60s, 65, he starts working on, on developing uh, an experiment. He's a chemistry, a chemist. And then he, he works on the experiment. It's very difficult to, to make it happen, but he finally makes it. And they test um, the the consequences of the, star, of the solar model, and then with the predictions, with the results of the, of the experiment. And what happens is that the, the difference between them is so large that it seems that actually the experiment is detecting around one third of the total amount that was predicted initially. So Davis blames Bacall, Bacall blames Davis, they discuss for a bit, uh, they go back home, they are working, one is working in California and the other one is working in North Dakota. And they meet after one year, each has work on the experiment and the standard solar model, new predictions, more accurate predictions, more accurate versions of the experiment, and they run the experiment. In the end, the difference is still very large and they cannot do anything to solve that. They have already, uh, adapt the model as much as possible. They had already cleaned the experiment as much as possible. And the problem is over there. And it's what is called the anomaly or uh, the problem of solar neutrinos. So um, that made it impossible for them to explain what was happening. And when we see the discussion, uh, we see people like John Bacall and Feynman saying that this was actually a contradiction. Uh, and we see people like Davis saying that it's only a gap. It's all, we are only lacking information. 
but even if we consider that is a contradiction, what we are going to see is that there is a lot of backup in favor of both parts of the contradiction. So the experiment uh, has been presented in different conferences and no radio chemist reacted to it as if that was something bad, as if something was bad in the assumptions or in the calculations, etc. And also the standard solar model was present in different conferences and the reaction was the same, that it was a good tool. So they couldn't solve the problem about how these two things relate to one another. Uh, and they were, in a sense, tolerated, motivated to tolerate the, the issue because the standard solar model and the experiment were still working very well in different areas. As I said, the standard solar model helped us to predict other behaviors and other properties of the stars, and it was working quite reliably in that sense. And the experiment um, gives the basis for further development in other types of particle detection. So it was also a good experiment. Uh, and they only felt that they had to keep working on these things and relying on these things, even though there was a clear anomaly uh, in between. And so the question is, how can we move from recognizing this type of ignorance to other epistemic goods such as understanding? And what I, I say that is coming from the inferentialist perspective is this first step, which is ensure the reliability of the information or the methods surrounding the anomaly. Now, how can we do that? As I was saying, uh, inferentialists would claim that the main tool would be to select certain type of inference patterns that allow us to preserve the quality of the information or at least to avoid damaging it more. So um, these inference patterns are things such as if you have all P and Q, then it is derivable from the theory, that is derivable from the theory, then to derive, uh, to derive QA from PA is an inference pattern. That's the most simple one. But you can call these inference patterns something broader that they are reasoning strategies or inferential strategies, which are going to be more heuristical tools about which parts of the theory combine, which avoid combining, and so on and so forth. So um, considering that, there are going to be at least three main types of inference patterns that we can consider when dealing with anomalies. And these are fragmentation, meaning I don't want to combine the this type of experiment with this part of the standard solar model. Uh, information restriction, I can use the assumptions behind the experiment and even the experiment itself when testing certain parts of the standard solar model or certain predictions of the standard solar model, but not all of them. And I will allow some information to flow to, from the standard solar model to fit the design of the experiment and um, back and forth, but that doesn't mean that I will mix them together because that maybe was what happened, uh, what caused the anomaly initially. And we also have precautionary strategies that allow us to mix information, but marking things that we think that are suspicious. And so after a round of revision, then we can say, oh, this, this actually is not a good mix. This actually is a reliable uh, union or a, a reliable uh, relation that exists between the theory and the experiment, for instance. So um, when we identify this, this inference patterns with these strategies that allow us to preserve the quality of the information, then we can say that we are already partially overcoming the ignorance of how to, this, this, is, this theory was structured. We are not really knowing that uh, that is the actual inference um, constraint, set of constraints of the theory, that those are not the inferential constraints that necessarily were violated with creating this anomaly. We don't know that but we know that these ones help us to solve the problems uh, that generated the anomaly. And so uh, it's something about the theoretical structure, but maybe it's only something possible. This might be the structure that is actually posited in this theory. At least some elements that allow me to preserve um, the safety mechanisms or the quality of the information should be part of the theoretical structure of the theory, maybe not all of them, or at least of the chunk of the theory that is creating the anomaly. Now, how can this relate to model understanding? 
what often happens is that uh, scientists start mastering these inference patterns. So they are trying different strategies. Suddenly they discover that one looks more reliable than others, and then they start mastering them. And suddenly what they are building are particular logical spaces that are constrained by these inference patterns that they think uh, allow us to show how to work with the theory and that particular domain that initially looked problematic. And what they are gaining is understanding of that logical space. So going back to model understanding. Model understanding, as I said before, means that we can have a clear picture of the set of possible words that correspond to the causal structure connections that are relevant with respect to some domain of the possibility space associated with the phenomenon in question. One has model understanding of some phenomenon if and only if one knows how to navigate so some of the possibility space associated with the phenomenon. What is understood in cases of defective theories is broadly speaking that some structure is being posited of some objects in some domain for the purposes of saying explanatory things about them given the positive structure. So in those, in those theories that have resilient anomalies, we can call them defective because we have no clarity about what the hell is going wrong. But still we can say these are logical or inferential constraints that are useful for managing the problem, maybe avoiding or containing at least the problem, but also are, help, uh, are helping us to be able to posit this, this structure in different possible domains. So um, a, a good example of having model understanding is when a person knows chess, uh, knows how to play chess, and then knows the rules, that's the general idea of knowing a logical space, but that is not enough for showing uh, that he is a master, right? So uh, I know how to play chess, but that doesn't mean that I actually can navigate satisfactorily the logical space, that I haven't mastered anything. So, uh, but when we look at these grandmasters playing, especially things like Blitz, what we are going to see is that they know that these things, the position, if they start with this uh, board, not from the from the starting point but with this board they are going to know how these constraints how this setting is going to constrain certain types of moves well at the beginning especially if you are the the first player uh, you have all possibility spaces when you have a setting already posited uh, on the board then your logical space is narrowed and that's what is going to be the next part of the talk before that, uh, I want to move back to the, the case study on solar neutrinos to explain how they relate to one another. So many, for, for the case of solar neutrinos, many auxiliary hypotheses were offered to make the theory and observations consistent. As I was saying, uh, one of the options is to say, uh, the experiment is not reliable, so we can just work with the standard solar model, but never combine it with the experiment. Um, that didn't work. They did fragmentation on, on the assumptions, uh, and that's what worked. So they discovered that one of the main assumptions of what neutrinos were was mistake. They had masses. And while tiny, they were very significant for what was going to be the essence of neutrinos. Neutrinos were changing flavors or were changing types. And so were of at least three types that were changing depending on their interactions with other particles. Now, what was happening in the experiment is that the experiment assumed for the detection that there were only one type of neutrinos and they were detecting only one type of neutrinos, letting the others to pass without detection. So um, that characterization of neutrinos actually revealed that there were many assumptions shared in the experiment and the interpretation of the standard solar model for the stars and for neutrino physics. And so um, that showed that there were going to be modifications in both the experiment and the theory that will help us to uh, structure in a more narrow way how the standard solar model should work for neutrino physics and particularly for the detection of new solar neutrinos flux. So this problem remained unsolved for something like 30, 40 years until uh, 2001. And then uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2011 
um, when neutrinos were explained as changing um, flavors and having masses. Now, what about model understanding? As I was saying in, in the case of the chessboard, if we assume that model understanding is me knowing which are the rules of chess, but not necessarily being able to navigate in concrete cases, then seems too broad. So we actually, what we need is a way to set, uh, to get a setting that constrains our logical spaces. And which are the elements that are going to help us, especially in cases in which we have high degrees of ignorance and we cannot solve the, the anomalies or we cannot explain out the anomalies that we are dealing with. And the second step in order to do that is going to be incorporate new information, even if it's still problematic. And this new information is going to come um, in the shapes of insights. So once ignorance of theoretical structure is partially overcome, I got some uh, logical constraints that are useful for me to navigate the space, but the sp logical space is still very broad. Uh, the question is, how can we move to other epistemic goods, such as understanding that are more concrete uh, in general cases in which ignorance is still present? And the idea is that this model understanding can be narrowed by setting a set of insights. If we look at the case of the solar neutrinos, what happened is that they had the insight that neutrinos could change uh, types. That was something that was present even before they tested in the 60s. That was a, a hypothesis that uh, appeared in the 50s. And they didn't trust it that much, but there was the insight over there. They didn't know where the insight was coming from. Uh, they didn't have the experiments to test. Uh, the, there were different types of neutrinos. They didn't have the theoretical tools to explain that, but there was the intuition that that was something that neutrinos would be able to do. So um, that insight was actually constraining when, when accepted as, as it, as something robust and something that is um, often considered to be true despite the fact that we might not know the procedure behind it or the justification behind it, um, when it was seen as an, uh, a reliable insight, then that constrained the model, the model understanding of neutrinos. So it was not just about how can we move uh, reliably and safely within this particular logical space associated to the standard solar model, but it was assumed that uh, solar neutrinos can actually change flavors. How is going to look like the possibility of space? And that was a more concrete and more reliable understanding than the one that they got before. The one that they got before was just, in a sense, pragmatical about how to move safely and avoiding having more anomalies or having more problems or increasing the degree of the problem that they had. But now, what, what is happening here, the insights are often coming from ignorance as well. So we might not know which is the procedure, the computational procedure behind um, assuming that this thing is true or that this consequence should be endorsed as true in the strong sense and so on and so forth. But it doesn't really matter for this issue because we are not talking about factual understanding. So even if we don't really know that the, the insight is true in a pragmatical sense, it is helping us to narrow our management of the logical space that we are uh, grasping at this point. So um, sketching the view, the achievement of understanding consists in building networks that successfully connect our scientific beliefs about the world. If the information contained uh, by the insights is put together with independent theoretical knowledge or this uh, overcoming of ignorance of theoretical structure, it becomes possible for scientists to generate e a representation of the object or the possible word or a proper part of the, that represents how the object is embedded in a relevant theoretical domain. However, given the distinct sources of knowledge of the object and the lack of unity in methods and conceptual resources, scientists cannot be sure that these possible words are actual. So I was saying model understanding hardly is going to become um, factive in, in the strong sense or a strongly explanatory. This is that these representations hold some actual empirical domain. And this is what, uh, and this is the reason why this is called model understanding. Now, before ending this talk, I, I said that I wanted to address the idea of this openness of model understanding being problematic. 
because it is not factive, then you might say, uh, well, it's good to be able to consider the possibilities associated to my theory. That's something that every scientist that is aiming at understanding should do. And so model understanding might be the first step. And it's understandable that in cases in which you have resilient anomalies and you don't have clarity about the structure of your theory or how it relates to observation and so on, uh, that you only get model understanding. That's totally uh, making sense. But can this enrich any, in any way the scientific further development? The intuition might be that not. That because it's very simple, it helps us to navigate the space, but only in that particular context. Now, how can, can we say that it's helpful? And what I think it's happening is that in, ca in similar cases, model understanding, because it's that broad, help us to see uh, as a heuristical tool, to see the similarities between new anomalies and the anomaly that we, uh, that we were involved with before. So, um, and this provides us with a better tool in a, in a methodological and heuristical sense than other types of understanding would. Because other types of understanding are more concrete, are more narrowed, and would, would increase your commitments to uh, the relation between the theory or the model and the phenomenon. But model understanding, because it's very broad, is more related to logic and to inference, then it gives you more tools. Uh, also narrowed, narrowed by the types of problems that uh, it's associated with, uh, narrowed by the context, uh, narrowed by maybe the theoretical constraints in general and so on, but it is still open enough to allow us to draw uh, conclusions regarding the similarities between one type of anomaly and the other. And what would the example is, uh, and before moving to the example, is um, when scientists master specific inference patterns within a particular domain, what they gain is a way to structure and follow successfully certain inferences in their day-to-day -day practice. This is not only that uh, they can use inferential rules in an effective way, but also that they can explain under which circumstances and why certain inferential rules are reliable in a domain of application of the theory. This is not all that model understanding is, but that's a very important feature that will allow us to say that the mastering of certain inference patterns would allow scientists to develop heuristics for interpreting and solving similar anomalies. Now, the example. Neutrinos anomaly part two. So um, neutrinos change flavors and we are very good with that. Uh, we gave this Nobel prize in 2011 and we thought that the problem was solved. Suddenly, what happened is that we have the following situation. Neutrinos can only mix or change flavors if they have mass. Yes, but that's something that uh, we have already stated before. Yeah, but we don't know how they get those masses. Uh, other elementary particles get masses by coupling with the Higgs boson. For doing so, it is necessary to have something that is called left-handed and right-handed versions of the particle and the Higgs boson, because we want them to match. So that's the reason why uh, they are referred as right-handed and left-handed. But we have never seen something like a ray a right-handed neutrino. So we have the following situation. Either right-handed neutrinos exist, but we haven't been able to detect them or they are of, different, of a different type of particles. Um, so this is the general problem uh, of what's happening with the masses of neutrinos. Now, neutrino physicists have something that is called neutrino global fit, which aims at the determine certain parameters for neutrino mixing that can fit all the data. This is general parameters about how much neutrino mix, regardless the type of experiment that we are running. In 2005, around 2005, uh, the liquid scintillator neutrino detector, LSND, said that uh, there was a problem. So it gathered neutrinos and measured neutrinos for something like five years from the 93 to the 98, and then process uh, all the data. And it said, you know, there, there is an anomaly here. Uh, I'm detecting more neutrinos than others. And I don't know, how can you explain it? The other experiments were in a sense, agreeing on the amount of the, 
on how to set in the parameters. So they physicists thought that LSMD was the problem. Oh yeah, you know, it's a different type of experiment, uh, has never been reliable, it's very old design. So that's the main problem. And then they designed the mini boom. And mini boom is um, maybe the most famous uh, neutrino detector right now. And so it's the most reliable. So in 2003, it was commissioned to test the LSMD um, results. 2007, Minibun said, ah, that was a mistake. LSMD is always mistaken. We, we knew that and so on and so forth. However, almost 10 years later, Minibun said, uh, sorry, I didn't have all the information before. It actually is the case that LSMD was right. So, all the other neutrino detectors, all the other experiments were mistaken. And the parameters for neutrino mixing were mistaken because they were based on, on the other experiments and were neglecting the Alice and the results. The difference of this, if you compare it in abstract sense with the difference of, of the measurement of the initial experiment is larger in this case. So this anomaly should be more, more important than the others. And so, how, how have physicists reacted to this? So they have developed some possible solutions. The first one is say, oh, there are some symmetry value violations um, that we can in a sense not explain now, but we can do it later. But this hypothesis has very low probability. Now there is the idea of the experimental problem. And what we're going to see is that the explanation that they have for the experimental problem being the case, saying, we don't understand the experiment, and that is the only reason why we cannot make sense of it. So we have to get a better grasp. It's also lower. And in the discussions, they often refer to the lessons that they have learned from the previous anomaly. So um, it's, it's often saying, well, you know, even LSD, uh, LSMD uh, works quite well in other contexts as the Davis experiment worked in good in other contexts. And there are many similarities drawn there. And also the idea of saying that uh, there, there, is, there could be a property that we haven't seen, uh, foreseen theoretically regarding neutrinos is more an option because they appeal to the, the revolution that it was, that it changed flavors. So they said maybe the most important hypothesis is to have something that we can call stereo neutrinos, meaning that neutrinos, there are certain types of neutrinos that do not have a lipton and do not have a flavor. And that is the reason why we don't detect them. So we only detect these three and we miss this one because it doesn't have a flavor. We haven't seen how it should interact with other particles, or at least we haven't developed a way to detect how it interacts with other neutrinos and so on. But the explanations that they are providing here appeal to, in general, the strategies that were followed to manage the first, uh, the first anomaly. So it seems that there is a sense in which um, what we are gaining, it's not only model understanding of the of the theoretical structure regarding the first anomaly, but also getting some heuristics or some general tools to interpret what the hell is happening here. This doesn't mean that because we gain model understanding of the first anomaly or of the first problem, we are now extrapolate that to say, oh, I also uh, understand at least morally what is happening here. That, that is not the case, but it helps us to in a sense approach in a more um, satisfactorily way, similar problems. And as I said, I think that relates to the fact that model understanding is broader than other types of understanding. So final remarks, what we have been doing here is a try to sketch an epistemological of the detection and overcoming of high degrees of ignorance in order to gain especially understanding, uh, especially model understanding, and the main thesis that I've been defending is that uh, in cases in which we have resilient anomalies, the associated type of ignorance is ignorance of theoretical structure. And that, that ignorance is the one to blame for the resilient character 
of um, these anomalies. Now, the partial overcoming of this ignorance is associated with the reliable use of specific insights that help us to narrow the logical space and to gain better, in a sense, model understanding or more accurate model understanding. And this model understanding in general can play a privileged role in the future overcoming or at least characterization or interpretation of ignorance in similar contexts. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to Dr. Del Gosagio Martinez Ortaz. And uh, I'm sure everyone in attendance joins me in applauding your work. And now there's room for some questions. By all means, please go ahead. If you'd like to make yourselves known either in chat or by using the um, raise hand button, we have a question from Professor Bruce Russell. Bruce, please go ahead. Thanks, I was trying to get, get, get muted, uh, unmuted. Um, I don't know, there's a basic issue about understanding. You know, when I gave my paper, I really didn't address the question of what understanding is, but I applied it to questions about a priori. But I wonder, you know, in, whether you think ultimately, it sounds like that you think understanding ultimately can be explained in terms of know how, know how to make inferences, know how to explain things and the like. And I wonder if it's sufficient. So the little example I think of does have to do with a logical constants like and, if I just know how to infer from and a, a and B, A, you know, or A and B, B and so forth, I don't think it's sufficient because I can think of a kind of like Chinese room example where the person really doesn't understand what's going on, but has the right sort of output that somebody who understood would have. So this is kind of, I think, a deeper question about the nature of understanding. And maybe, this is kind of ironic, do I misunderstand what you mean by understanding or do you think it really can be adequately explained in terms of knowing how to make certain moves of inferences or explanations and the like? Well, thank you, thank you very much for your question. As I said, that, that has to be one of the first intuitions about this type of approach to understanding and that actually reveals that you understood. Uh, but also coming from philosophy of logic, what you will say is that to know logical constraints and to be able to navigate logical constraints doesn't reduce only to be able to infer, infer but also to be able to provide explanations about uh, why these logical constraints are suited there, and which are the consequences that they have within a particular theory, for instance, at the level of determining truth values and so on. And so uh, as more you, you increase the complexity about which are these logical constraints and how to interpret them philosophically, you're going to realize that, yes, this knowing how in terms of drawing inferences is part of, of what we are doing here, but it's not all of it. So uh, model understanding consists in explaining also how certain type of uh, logical space is set in that particular domain, which are the constraints and which aren't the constraints there. Because as it is broader than uh, other types of understanding, there are certain constraints that are going to be lost, but to be able to understand in, in a model sense, will include to be able to assess that, that absence of, of certain constraints. Does you that be able to assess? Us? Sorry. The I mean. absence, that absence of certain constraints. Okay, thank you. Thank you, but thank you for your question. All right, thanks so much, Bruce, for the question, Maria, for answering. And um, let's see if there are some more questions. Uh, I see uh, Insa's comment in chat, and I wholeheartedly uh, echo it. This, the case study is entirely uh, amazing. So thanks for that. Um, I, uh, I wanted to uh, use that as a, as a spin for, for a question I, I might ask. So um, um, if we uh, uh, think of maybe the most, the, the skimmest milk, concept available for modal understanding, it 
would probably be something like this, right? Grasping or seizing uh, how things stand in modal space. So how things could have been, how things might have been, uh, how things might develop and so on. Um, and if, if we just have that uh, sort of, um, sort of skim milk notion of modal understanding, um, then much of the richness of the uh, case study that you've presented uh, isn't really sort of brought to the fore. This, this idea of um, um, uh, how to estimate the reliability of uh, uh, methods used in various experiments and the uh, sort of um, uh, 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 turning the tables against what one thought was uh, orthodoxy and what one thought was uh, trustworthy experimental data and what one thought was as discarded data and so on. So all of that and all the um, um, seem, seems to um, um, be incredibly rich and not uh, uh, be um, a part of this uh, modal space business, right? And so it seems to me as though that's the, your, your historical example is a gold mine. And um, uh, part of, so, so here's the, the sort of uh, epistemologically deflationary worry. Could you have uh, supported your view of modal understanding with uh, examples that were far less uh, fascinating and far less uh, sort of historically challenging? Could, could you have said, uh, so I'm thinking of, of uh, something simple like, um, uh, well, well, not simple, but uh, for a long time, people thought that um, uh, instantaneous velocity could tend to infinity, right? Then uh, people thought that um, uh, the uh, speed of light is a bit of a threshold. Uh, and so it turns out that now modal space was pruned, was narrowed down right, to uh, uh, afford only those circumstances as possible in which uh, velocities are uh, uh, at most the speed of light, right? So I just, you know, here's a very uh, sort of high school textbook. Is this the kind of modal space pruning that you're interested in? Or um, um, could you say a bit more about um, why modal understanding is important and why this caricature that I just drew up isn't sort of representative of what you're really after. Thanks. So yes, much. Th thank you for your question. So um, first of all, one, one of the main things that I have to, to say is that the general idea of modal understanding is due to Swazik uh, Levihan. And so but she, she doesn't narrow this in, to my taste enough. And, and so that is the reason why I think that in many cases, as it is your intuition, model understanding looks a bit trivial. Uh, looks like it, it is something that we should be able to do. I mean, to be able to see how the world would look like, but in that sense, it also would be something that we would be able to do or we should be able to do when uh, reading literature in general or fiction and so on. And so uh, what is the import of model understanding here? And that is the reason why I decided to focus, first of all, in anomalies that are resilient, that make these cases fascinating, but also that in a sense fit the intuition that in other situation, we wouldn't be able to gain any type of understanding over there because there is a mess around these theories and there is a mess around the observation and there is a mess about uh, the way in which we can fit these two things together. And so the way in which we tend to solve these problems is by shedding light on things that I, I like to call inferential strategies. With our, broader than just saying uh, there is this rule modus ponens and that that is an inferential rule but saying things that are uh, separating things here it works but here mixing them it's okay and, and things like that that are going to be constrained by logic but are broader than logic so uh, that are going to be compatible with different logical constraints but not with every logical constraint and that that is the first narrowing step now, the second arrowing step, it relates to the types of things that we do with these strategies in, that, in those particular contexts. And that will allow us to see how there are certain inferences that uh, might not hold. 
uh, for instance, simplification. There are cases in which we cannot simplify it and say that it's a reliable inference, even though intuitively and according to classical logic, it should be a reliable inference. And so uh, in that sense, in the end, what we get in these anomaly cases are uh, more structured situations for us epistemic agents to be able to manage the problem and also to say, oh, I understood in a sense why the problem is here. And I understood in a sense how to proceed in order to avoid more problems or how to make sense of this uh, together with this other thing. And so um, that, that is in general the whole picture. Good, thank you so much. That is that is highly illuminating. And um, uh, I, I feel like I wanna ask a follow-up but I don't wanna monopolize the conversation. So if there's some more questions, please um, uh, uh, make yourself known. Because otherwise, let me just uh, uh, say this. Um, uh, it seems as though there uh, might at least be uh, uh, two uh, maybe different notions of modal space at play. Uh, so um, you see what's going on. There's incredibly rich scientific material there and then I keep asking about modal space. Okay, good. Uh, so one notion might be this, this older view. Um, uh, I think Richard Montague has this paper called Theories uh, and uh, their uh, uh, theories are conceived of as syntactic objects, right, uh, sets of axioms, uh, and we just close laws of logical consequences over them and we get the set of theorems and lo and behold, that's a theorem. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, the theory. And um, uh, there'll be a modal space corresponding to that because there'll be a necessity operator uh, that will be uh, defined by the set of axioms, right? Uh, or theorems equivalently. So um, that's a sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, a flashback to the 60s maybe. Uh, uh, notion of modal space. And then on the other hand, when you talk about uh, which methods are reliable and which methods are not reliable uh, for uh, measuring uh, various things in various experiments, and I'm just going to leave it at that, um, it seems as though the reliability in question is a modally robust notion, right? Um, uh, to say that uh, a method is reliable is not just to say that it got the right result, but that we ought to have expected it to get the right result. It often enough gets the right result with respect to some thresholds. Um, uh, it would have been implausible. It would have been extremely unlucky for it to get the wrong result, right? So notions of luck, of probability, of um, uh, 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 modal robustness and how close uh, uh, these uh, surprise worlds are to our own possible world. Uh, all of these are sort of modally infused. And that seems to suggest uh, another notion of modal space in the background, right? And these are very, very different. And um, it might be, uh, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, uh, Sawzik's line and Stephen uh, Grimm's line as well, is that uh, we don't need to choose between these various notions. That there's a kind of metaphysically uh, a prior notion of a modal space. Um, but I wonder if if you have if you have favorites. There are so many uh, notions of modal space on shopping. So um, is is did you uh, want this to be a question? Uh, your your project leaves open, or did you have? Uh, uh, your own preferences here. And I ask that, and I promise I'll stop. I ask that because um, uh, one of the issues I found to be most interesting in your project was the way that uh, this kind of very uh, 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 historically informed philosophy of science blends with the philosophy of logic. When you talk about the relationship between ignorance and uh, contradiction, and that seems to, to, to uh, sort of raise the question about what we mean by modal space, what we mean by consistency. Uh, and yeah, so that's that's the sort of background for, for the question. Thanks so much. No, thank you. Thank you for the question. I'll try to keep the answer short because uh, I think we are running over time. Uh, but yes, so what I want is to, to keep this open, not because 
I, I think it should be open. I, I, pay, I have my own preferences, but because I think it should be neutral from my own preferences. And so what you might have seen during the presentation and that you might consider and might have been a, an error uh, was that I used interchangeable modal possibility space and logical space. And the reason is that because uh, in contrast with uh, Swazil and, and others, I don't have metaphysical commitments here. I, I am only coming from the inferentialist point of view. And in that sense, I don't, I don't distinguish between what, whether I need act, an actual uh, operator of necessity or a possibility around that. But what I am saying is that it is a possibility space. The logical space in general is a possibility space because you, you might be able to instantiate uh, the properties that you are talking about and the relations that you are talking about in different contexts that look alike, but that are not the same. And so the theory is, is in that sense uh, broader than other interpretations of theories or models that are mostly intended for a particular domain and only for that particular domain or very similar ones. And so uh, that is going to happen that with understanding as well. So uh, all these constraints are going to allow you for to do certain things, such as, as I was saying, choosing between the interpretation of, of your inferential commitments. Uh, the same inferential strategies might hold for different logics, but the further you move in your choosing, the further you will have to commit to particular types of logical constraints. And so, and there is where I have certain preferences. I think that in the large majority of cases of resilient anomalies, those constraints have to be non-classical, for instance. They have to be relevant or have to be relating and, and so, so on and so forth, but that's more a logical issue than, than a philosophical, from philosophy of science or an epistemological one. So, but uh, yeah, thank you, thank you very much for. So for much talk. at stake, so much at stake, Maria. We're very grateful for your talk. Please join me once again in thanking Dr. Martinez Octas. And with your permission, let's take the customary two minutes break. And Silvio, thanks so much for your patience. And I want to say understand.